So, my name is Hans Sertrens, and uh, I traveled all the way from Copenhagen, where I coordinate the Center for Modern European Studies. As you can see, me and my colleagues in Copenhagen are dealing with issues related to European culture, comparative history, history of ideas, and identities. But I am also affiliated with ARENA. ARENA is the Center for European Studies of the University of uh, Oslo, where uh, over the last years we coordinated a quite large research project, which was called RECON. Um, you find still the website uh, of this project with uh, many relevant publications. We coordinated uh, research on questions of European um, public sphere, civil society, and also collective identities. And we had the, the possibility to cooperate with partners all over Europe. So I give you these two websites. Uh, actually, I forgot the third website of my center in uh, Copenhagen. It's www.seamus.ku. Uh, 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 well, sorry for this, but uh, you find the information. Uh, just Google my name and uh, you find it. Anyway, uh, the most relevant publications that you might be interested to look at, you find uh, at uh, this project webpage uh, from our Recon uh, project. And this is also a little bit what I am planning to, uh, um, to talk with you today. Anyway, I understand that you come from all different parts of Europe and the world. Is this right? So... More or less, yes. <laughs> and I hope we will have the possibility over these days to uh, talk to each other. You can, of course, also approach me uh, during the breaks uh, and uh, during the next days if you have uh, some questions or some things to discuss uh, with me. I'm available to talk to you. Uh, I am here until uh, Thursday evening. And... Um, yeah, I understand that I lecture now for uh, two hours, is this right? So we should have uh, a break after one hour, 50 minutes or so. Maybe make me a sign from the back when... <laughs> or maybe I can also read it in your faces that you start to, <laughs> to lose the attention and to be tired. Then uh, we should have a coffee break. So... Qualitative research methods, how to study collective identity formation in relation to European integration. So I thought before I do anything here, I confront you with this quotation, which I found yesterday when I looked up some information about Jena. So it is a quote, I saw the emperor, this world soul, riding out of the city on reconnaissance. It is indeed a wonderful sensation to see such an individual who, concentrated here at a single point, astride a horse, reaches out over the world and masters it. This extraordinary man whom it is impossible not to admire. Who do you think uh, said this? Well, it was Hegel. And why did he say this? He said it here in Jena. What was the occasion? Well, Napoleon conquered Jena. And I think there are very few occasions that a conqueror coming from, from the outside, coming from abroad, is welcomed in such a way. But Hegel welcomed Napoleon with these very enthusiastic words. So this here is the moment. You see here uh, Napoleon on his white horse. This is the market square of Jena. And here you see uh, Hegel uh, bowing uh, his head. And Napoleon in a way, stands for Europe, stands for something Europeans have in common. This is the reason why Napoleon was welcomed here as the, as the conqueror from, uh, from Paris, because he brought a whole message. 
the idea of a new order, the idea of a new social and political order, the idea of progress. And this is the reason why intellectuals like Hegel, who was working here at Jena University, but also very ordinary men um, were enthusiastic about Napoleon and the ideas of the French Revolution. So the idea of Napoleon was to unite Europe, to unite the continent under uh, the ideas of the French Revolution. The French Revolution should be brought uh, to the whole of Europe. This was his mission. He had a mission. And here's another intellectual who was working at Jena University one decade, uh, one decade earlier. It is uh, Schiller, and uh, this university, the name of this university is uh, Schiller University of Jena. And he is also relevant for what we discuss today as a European identity. Why is he relevant? For a very banal reason. He wrote the Order of Joy, which is the, which is the European anthem the unofficial European uh, anthem, because uh, the constitution that uh, was meant to, um, uh, to lay this down uh, uh, did never see uh, the light. But you see that this is a quite good place uh, to be in Jena and to discuss uh, the topic uh, of this week. And now I can do something more to the topic, maybe, which is to discuss with you methods, how to approach European identity, or rather what I will call processes of European identity form uh, formation. We can also call it processes of identification with Europe as a political uh, or cultural or social entity. So I want to discuss with you qualitative approaches, how to understand the formation of something that can be called a European identity. And before I do this, I of course need to clarify what I understand, uh, uh, what I think a collective identity is about. What is it about? So I need to provide some definition uh, that we have a common understanding of what we talk when we talk about collective identities. And I guess you had some discussions about this uh, over uh, the last two days. And um, First of all, my approach would be to say that this course here is not about how to study collective identities, but we talk here about how to study collective identity formation. So we look at processes, not at substance. We look at processes of historical and social formation or transformation. And I am a sociologist. And as a sociologist, I can deliver, uh, in the broadest term, uh, the following definition, which is that the process of collective identity formation is a process of differentiation. So identity formation has to do with, with differentiation, which is a key term used in uh, sociology, uh, which is to say that a collective identity is formed in difference to something else. So the key word here is identity and uh, difference. And this is, of course, quite banal to say that identities are related to, uh, to difference, but it is not so banal what it implies for how to study identities. It is about communication of difference. And the claim would be that, communi uh, that communication about difference generates um, something to be called identity. And on the other hand, communication about identities generates difference. This is a quote which I took from uh, Klaus Eder. It's a text that I distributed 
uh, as a reading for this lecture. So maybe you can reflect a little bit about this sentence, that, uh, that communication of difference generates identity, and communication about identity generates difference. Does anyone want to comment this? Does this sound familiar to you? I mean, you can take it as a key formula in how we think about Europe, because we think of Europe also as a unity in, the, in diversity, as difference that is united by something we call identity, European identity. So difference and identity or unity and diversity, this is a kind of uh, key notion or a key formula in European thinking. This goes back to the, uh, to the ancient Greeks, uh, Aristoteles, who wrote about the whole and its parts. And of course, this is, this is also Christianity. Quite often, uh, from a historical perspective, European ad identity is related to Christianity. And Christianity is the same idea. God is a unity in difference. This is the idea of the, uh, of the Holy Trinity as uh, um, and for sociologists, if you look at processes of identification, we cannot do this without looking at uh, processes of differentiation. So we, um, through uh, our ways to communicate difference, we generate something that can be called identity. And when we turn we can call this when we turn the perspective as an observer and look from unity, from identity, only from this perspective we can uh, distinguish. We can, uh, um, we can uh, identify the differences, uh, so to speak, which is almost uh, paradoxical. So, so identity is an act of differentiation. And this means that the more difference we have, the more we need identity. The more a society is differentiated, the more it needs to problematize its identity. And this, of course, is counterintuitive, because we would usually assume that the more homogeneous a group is, the stronger is the identity of this group. We would say that a homogeneous group has a strong identity. But what we learn here is that the opposite is true. The more differentiated a, a social group is, the more it is in need of uh, an identity. So small and homogeneous groups um, do not necessarily need strong identities. But also traditional societies, if you think of traditional societies, the notion of, of identity was quite alien uh, to traditional uh, societies. The whole um, notion of identity only came up with modernization, which is uh, the emergence of differentiated uh, societies. So a social differentiation um, generated a kind of a need uh, um, for, uh, to express collective identities, uh, to problematize identities. Identities became problematic through differentiation, you can say it. And this is, of course, also an important uh, message to understand identities in uh, theoretical terms. The more, diverse, uh, the more diverse individuals become, the more uh, groups then are in need of identity. And if you read, uh, again, the text of Klaus Eder, he makes at one point the example of a group of monkeys. He says that a group of monkeys is the most homogeneous, the most stable group we can imagine, but precisely for this reason we cannot say that a group of monkeys has an identity. So human beings are not monkeys because they have uh, the kind of reflexive capacities to differentiate themselves from others. Reflection means differentiation uh, in light of uh, some imaginary unity. And from there we start to develop collective identities. So differentiated social groups of humans uh, problematize collective identities. 
Any question to this point? Would you understand now why Europe needs a collective identity? Whenever we think about Europe, we think in terms of differences, the many differences that make Europe, the plurality that makes Europe. So differences are the kind of constitutive act to think about Europe. And all of you can certainly mention differences that structure the European space. We should not be scared uh, by these differences. This is our starting point to think about Europe. The east-west difference, the north-south difference, that has suddenly become quite prominent again now with the crisis. So we understand now this formula that is used by the European Union, uh, united uh, in diversity. The unity of Europe is the plurality of its differences. It's simply a sociological insight, uh, not something that has been invented by uh, the European Commission. And what about a nation state? Is a nation state not a unity in diversity? If we say that Europe or European identity is based on a unity in diversity, what about a nation state? from this perspective here. Think again of uh, the French Revolution we just talked about. Yeah? I'd rather be able to say anything about the French Revolution, but um, I mean, mm -hmm. that depends on if you refer um, difference mm -hmm. to, um, you know, nation states, if the category you're thinking of is a nation mm -hmm. state or mm -hmm. regions or um, subnational levels or whatever, because um, if you only refer to nation state, obviously that would mean that nation state is mm -hmm. pure unity without any difference uh, within mm -hmm. the nation state. Mm -hmm. So you would only have like, I don't know, you can actually count the differences saying you've got 28 member states, so mm -hmm. you've got 28 different, you know, mm -hmm. unities that, that work together, which is, yeah. would, would probably contradict um, But the process of results. nation building, as we studied it in the, during the 19th century, had to do with building unity out of diversity. Yeah. Only that uh, the nation state at some point overemphasized the element of uh, unity. The, uh, um, the mission was to make all individuals equal to become equal uh, members, to build a homogeneous um, co uh, community. But nevertheless, historically speaking, processes of nation building are processes of building unity from diversity that remain necessarily incomplete. Yeah? How would you see language and religion, I mean, for example, in nation state, mm -hmm. in uh, mm -hmm. state formation, this was, mm -hmm. let's say, relatively easier. You mentioned France mm -hmm. uh, unifying yeah. uh, the country under uh, one language, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. whereas I don't see this in Europe also because there is no dominant. Yeah, but there you see precisely the limits of nation building, that uh, a country like France could Im yeah, kind of impose the revolutionary ideals of the French Revolution on the whole pe uh, population to make all equals in a secular society that disregarded uh, religion and that uh, unified through language, through the use of the French language. This was not possible in, in other parts of Europe. Here in Germany, it was not possible precisely for religious reasons. You had a basic diversity in religious terms that needed to be respected from the very beginning. In other countries, you had language divides that could not be overcome. Uh, it took a lot of authority and sometimes violence uh, to build a unified uh, nation in linguistic terms. The French case is an example uh, for this. Also in Germany, it took uh, several decades uh, to unify uh, 
the nation linguistically, with some small language minorities uh, uh, remaining. Other countries like Switzerland uh, did never try. Others like Belgium tried for a short time but had to give up very soon. So you find a very similar constellation in uh, most uh, nation states, and the problem uh, of a European identity, this idea of unity and diversity, is by no way uh, uh, new or um, uh, uh, particular. We need to understand it from the broader background of, of how we in Europe uh, are used, are trained, are socialized in thinking about collective identities. Um, if I say now identities emerge as an act of differentiation, what is differentiation then? Or how do we differentiate? And again, the sociological answer is through communication. So we signify something in distinction to something else. And this is something that uh, a sociological theories from Habermas to Luhmann kind of uh, agree that, uh, that communication is a basic uh, formula uh, that the social is constituted uh, through uh, communication and identity then uh, in the most basic sense is a communicative act. And any drawing of borders uh, uh, is uh, an act of communication. And this means nothing else that borders are not natural, they're not given borders are drawn. We draw the borders of the social by entering into communicative relationships with each other. And here I can give you the first, uh, if you talk about qualitative methodologies, how to study collective identities, we study collective identities through communication. Whenever we study um, identities, we study communication. Um, so identities become salient whenever people enter into a communication with each other about the self and about others. Whenever people differentiate the social through communication. And this helps us to distinguish then what is not a collective identity. And again, this is useful if you think about, or if you want to approach now qualitative uh, research methodologies to analyze collective identities, uh, what do we consider as not appropriate? And the conclusion here is indeed that we often empirically analyze as identities what in fact is not an identity. Examples, for instance, are attitudes. If you use opinion points to measure individual attitudes, what do we measure then? If you use, for instance, Eurobarometer, what does Eurobarometer measure? You have probably in other lectures today or yesterday, you have dealt with Eurobarometer data and the problems of Eurobarometer. And uh, it measures attitudes, individual attitudes that are aggregated. So you have a representative sample of the whole population and you ask uh, individuals uh, through uh, fixed uh, uh, questions, you use the particular parameters uh, to explore attitudes of individuals which you aggregate. But of course these individuals do not communicate. It is not an act of communication. It is uh, something that is, uh, that is maybe used as material for, uh, uh, for communication. But in the uh, a moment that you survey it, uh, communication about identities has not taken place. And I think this is a problem in measuring identities um, through such predefined uh, sets of indicators, which might 
have, uh, which people might have quite different understandings. And all these nuances, of course, we cannot measure. We only have an aggregate uh, number at the end uh, that we can use. So the questionnaire has some implicit uh, meaning um, that uh, uh, we cannot really control. So uh, by questioning then, we might produce some effects of asking questions that might not be the questions that people would uh, ask themselves. We cannot know this. But nevertheless, these questionnaires produce some interesting reality. There is an output of these questionnaires. And you know it from, uh, from Eurobarometer. Uh, they show, yeah, uh, continuously, um, uh, they show um, that identification takes place at, uh, at different levels, that, um, that identification uh, with Europe is uh, continuously uh, low. Uh, but that they are overlapping uh, degrees of identification if you use these indicators. But on the other hand, we observe that the communicative space of Europe is continuously expanding. So something is happening here that does not show up in the surveys. And obviously, the questions that are asked in these surveys, they do not tell us about the symbolic forms, that circulate in the expanding communicative spaces uh, in uh, Europe. But nevertheless, these Eurobarometer data, they create some reality that can be used for identity talk. We find, for instance, quite often, as we do here in seminars, that we interpret Eurobarometer data. Journalists make frequent references to Eurobarometer data political actors, political parties make reference to Eurobarometer data. They do so to justify uh, particular decisions, um, to uh, make arguments uh, pro or against Europe. In other words, they use, our, they use Eurobarometer to enter identity talk, identity discourse. So uh, Eurobarometer data are not they are irrelevant for measuring a European identity, but we need to, uh, um, to, uh, we need to take a close look um, at how uh, they are used uh, by uh, relevant uh, social groups and actors, and how they are constructed, how they are produced. Did you have a talk about Eurobarometer? Someone want to say something about it? <laughs> Was this uh, contradictory to what you have heard before? Or? Anyone want to defend Eurobarometer? <laughs> you are invited to defend Eurobarometer. Some of you might use Eurobarometer in their uh, thesis. So you can tell us how you use it. Anyone wants to say something on this? But you see the basic problem, that Eurobarometer aggregates individual attitudes, and my argument here would be that identity needs to be analyzed through discourse, through talk, through identity politics, you can also call it. Identities need to be contested. There need to be um, 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 the concerns um, and the kind of questions need to be posed by the people who are involved in this. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. So if you say that, um, I was wondering that before, is this actually a standpoint against survey research in general? Because you say mm -hmm. this can't be done, or is it more the way the questions are asked? So is there mm -hmm. a need for the people to reflect on it after the question was posed because you said, you know, mm -hmm. it could be a basis for discussion. Mm -hmm. But if I understand you correctly, it would be basically, you know, you would say we have to do qualitative research, quantitative research to mm -hmm. just put it in both corners just doesn't mm -hmm. work at all for identity mm -hmm. research. Well, I personally would use uh, 
uh, qualitative research methods to deconstruct Eurobarometer opinion polls. <laughs> but deconstructed in a way that I also take into consideration possible effects of Eurobarometer, because they exist and uh, they might have some interesting effects. For instance, how Eurobarometer data are used by political actors to justify if, political, if a Eurosceptic party makes constant use of Eurobarometer data to argue that a European identity cannot exist or that Europe has no legitimacy in, in the minds of the people. So there's a political use here uh, of Eurobarometer data, uh, which again might have quite interesting effects on how we uh, construct and reconstruct identities. Yeah? Sorry, but um, so if you say that European identity or any identity would need to be constructed and therefore also be observed through mm -hmm. discourse, mm -hmm. what do we observe in a survey like the Eurobarometer then? What is this? Is, is this identity? Is it something else? Is it... Well, I'm not even claiming that um, these artifacts we construct through survey data are unrelated to discourse. Because, of course, the individuals have um, uh, the kind of attitudes uh, they come up with at the moment they have to fill in the questionnaires uh, come from somewhere. But I cannot control from where. And the way I aggregate them um, um, that at the end I arrive at a number um, which is completely detached from the kind of life world experiences of the particular individuals that are asked. So it would be interesting to make maybe interviews uh, with people who have participated in Eurobarometer data uh, to find out how uh, they uh, take the decisions to, to choose uh, four and not uh, five, for instance. Yeah? <laughs> Yeah. But then we arrive at the problem of communication, mm -hmm. and you talk about communication a lot. Mm -hmm. So how are we to approach the, any issue at all, not only issue of collective identity mm -hmm. in the EU 27, EU 28? Because I, I doubt it that there is anybody <laughs> capable of doing comparative discourse research in more than... Mm -hmm five countries? I don't know, maybe oh, yes. ten OK tops, mm -hmm. if he's really smart. Yeah, so I, I wonder can't. what, I mean, I know mm -hmm. in your project, for instance, you had a lot of people from different countries, but mm -hmm. um, that is, of, of course, only possible when you have a lot of funding mm -hmm. and really good um, mm -hmm. structure behind it. Mm -hmm. But for us, uh, doing our PhD projects, mm -hmm. modestly trying to approach this question, obviously this is something mm -hmm. um, impossible. Mm -hmm. So you think it is convenient to have prefabricated data delivered by the <laughs> European uh, Commission that can be used for the PhDs. And um, you are certainly right that it is quite challenging to do, uh, for instance, a comparative uh, media uh, uh, surveys. And that this cannot be expected in a single uh, PhD project. But there might be other methods, and I will come to this in a minute. Mm -hmm. Can you yeah? say something to it? I, yeah, I don't think that uh, we might ac accept the uh, fabricated data be just because uh, yes, sure, we possibly. feel more comfortable with that. But yes. um, you are a critical scholar. I <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I don't. I don't use Eurobarometer in my PhD. Mm -hmm. I use a different survey developed in in, in a European mm -hmm. project as well. And mm -hmm. of course, even if it was developed specifically for the issues of identity representation, mm -hmm. it is still a survey. So I was wondering whether you would, I think, more or less in the direction of your question, mm -hmm. would you even disregard um, tools that might be developed specifically for that as, uh, as you advocate for the use of analysis of discourse for these issues? And your question was whether I would disregard this. Yes, even, even if we would um, dedicate our time and resources to the development of specific tools, but still in, in a quantitative manner, mm -hmm. would you even then 
think no, that I it's do not, not want the to way make to go. any either or that those who do quantitative Eurobarometer uh, surveys are necessarily wrong, and that the only right way here is to do uh, qualitative uh, discourse analysis. I definitely do not want to say this. I only want to point out uh, some uh, problems uh, in uh, using uh, quantitative Eurobarometer data uh, for the analysis of identity uh, formation processes. And these problems you should be aware of, and then you find your own way how to deal with these problems. Or maybe you find a very good response to it and, uh, and come to the conclusion that I am wrong. So don't take it now uh, as a word, but think about it and uh, be reflexive how you use uh, quantitative data in light of um, alternative uh, qualitative methods and then argue for the strength of your method and stick to your choice. I'm sure you find good arguments and good reasons uh, to, st um, to stick to your quantitative method. So we are not running here into a competition who is doing uh, real science. This is not the purpose, but I am presenting some arguments and you can contest me on the basis of what I challenge you. Yeah? Yeah? Again, I will be the defensor of <laughs> your barometer, but so you, you take more or less the same stance and then uh, Pierre Bourdieu, uh, uh, yep. I think a long time ago, so saying mm -hmm. that you uh, aggregate different attitude, but there is an implicit, implicit assumption here mm -hmm. is that when someone talks freely, it's the truth, mm -hmm. it's true language, mm -hmm. and when you ask some, someone a question, it would be something like an artifact. And mm -hmm. in a way, I find that strange, you know, like, if you ask a question to someone and he answers, it's, mm -hmm. it's as we are as when you ask, talk freely. And mm -hmm. I don't understand why it would be uninter uh, uninteresting when you ask to someone a question just to see what he answers, mm -hmm. saying that, ah, yeah, may maybe we we'll, uh, understand the question differently that you did, but hey, that's like any question, and the, the, it's the same in an interview in creative research. I mean, you have mm -hmm. different, you, you, everybody, everybody knows that there are many uh, influence mm -hmm. of, uh, of the uh, person who asks the question, and mm -hmm. there is no, I mean, the implicit epistemology of this position mm -hmm. is a kind of very positivist epistemology saying, okay, I will look at the truth as she is, as it is, without modifying anything, mm -hmm. we're just regarding, we're just looking at and sort of, and uh, don't touch anything. Mm -hmm. But science is experimentation and is, you know, uh, changing the world to know how mm -hmm. our action make it change. And I think it's also what do you barometer. So, it's not the best, but it's not very different from interviews. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I kind of agree with what you are saying. Uh, you were referring to, uh, to Pierre Bourdieu. Um, the best, uh, you seem to be uh, French speaking, the best uh, author I know uh, who has delivered a very uh, good critique of uh, survey data analysis is Champagne. Uh, yeah, Patrick Champagne, exactly, yeah. So you find the reference uh, uh, and can read this further. I don't think this book has ever been translated in... Uh, yeah, but it just takes mm -hmm. both your arguments in some yeah. way. I think he was a scholar of... Uh, he was uh, uh, cooperating with Bourdieu at that time. Anyway, um, maybe we should go ahead and uh, I should... I don't need to go into detail here, you will probably more easily agree with uh, the other two uh, um, arguments here, that a qualitative identity is not something that can be, um, something that is culturally given, a substrate uh, of um, um, culture. Um, um, So the argument is that there are no kind of objective criteria uh, how to approach a collective identity. Some criteria that, that would be common to all and that everyone has the same understanding. It's precisely also how you said that also in opinion polls we can um, um, 
also when we run the opinion polls, we can accept that people, of course, have a subjective understandings to the kind of uh, questions and um, take this into consideration in the interpretation of uh, the data. But um, nevertheless, it is something that cannot be repeated often enough because this is still the dominant way how uh, we talk about national identity, uh, that there is some cultural substrate that makes us either French or German, and we wish then a European identity to follow a similar model. And let me just give you a short overview on empirical approaches that are used to um, uh, there are some kind of established research routines to deal with the European identities, and maybe again you find yourself in your own work um, here on one of these uh, uh, three routines I mentioned. Uh, one is what I call counting identities. This is the most passive. It's a purely descriptive approach, and it consists in a kind of widespread attitude of scientists, uh, but also politicians, to determine the distribution of collective identities in a quantitative way. And the research task then consists in developing descriptive criteria to categorize uh, people into identity containers, you can call it, and you apply numerical indicators to classify uh, social groups, to classify the identities of groups. And social identities are then explained as an aggregation of individual attitudes. This is what we just discussed in the case of uh, what Eurobarometer is doing. And like Eurobarometer, you then demarcate a kind of plural identitarian uh, field. Um, and you can scale the attitudes uh, of the people. You can be more or less unionized, and you can even express this in numbers. This is a practice of what is called numerical identification. You find this, I think, in another text of Kathleen Kantner. Did I give this as a reading? Yeah, she talks about this, uh, that this is a form of numerical identification. And the problem, as we just discussed it, it does not tell us anything about the relevance of the indicators which are used to categorize uh, these particular groups. And uh, the practice of counting identities uh, uh, might nevertheless become relevant. It, it might become relevant for the self-recognition of those groups. You can reflect yourself in the survey data. This is another interesting effect here. And quite often identity conflicts are about using the right indicators. So identity politics, identity conflicts are quite often about precisely these indicators. What are the right, and what are the right indicators to describe us as Germans? Um, this can be uh, uh, a quite heavily uh, discussed uh, topic, not only in science, uh, but also open to political debates. And you find quite often that social groups, they use these statistical indicators to negotiate their identities, to discuss the particular merits uh, of their identities. Then the second established research routine I want to distinguish here is what I call administering identities. And what I mean here is that the attempt by government to strategically deal with diverse identities within a particular political uh, context, to give particular rights uh, to groups with distinct identities, to protect minorities, for instance. And the European Union has taken up this agenda. Uh, they have chosen a more active and a quite interventionist approach. They want to promote cultural diversity as a core European value. They also want to protect diversity. They want to protect uh, minorities. So they have chosen a diversity-friendly approach. Um, they also emphasize subsidiarity as one of the guiding principles uh, of something that is called good governance. 
So they are committed to diversity, and this is also uh, reflected in the European treaties. Um, Article 22 um, of the Charter of Fundamental Rights states that the Union shall respect cultural, religious, and linguistic diversity. So this notion of cultural diversity is meant here as a kind of self-restrictive value. The scope, of EU, the scope of EU activism should be limited by it. And uh, it is the task then of, for instance, the European Commission, the particular DG that deals with cultural policies. They see it as their task uh, to protect cultural diversity, um, to, uh, to administer the existing cultural pluralism that makes uh, Europe and use no all kind of uh, programs that, um, uh, that are drafted uh, to do this. And you find uh, similar policies to administer identities uh, also at the level of the Council of Europe uh, or also at the level, at the international level, uh, through the uh, UNESCO. Then a third research routine to look at uh, processes of European identity uh, formation is what I call selling identities. May I ask you a question related yes. to the previous one? How is administrative identities a research strategy? It seems to me to be more of a policy strategy. Mm -hmm. Well, this is typically done by political scientists. Uh, they, um, they analyze, uh, for instance, particular programs that are launched by the European Commission. The European Year of Language, for instance. That is a campaign. And uh, they use it as a case study. So they look at particular practices uh, of a European administration, um, how they implement cultural policies and what effects this has. This would be one example. It's good that you ask. Mm -hmm. And the last would be, um, for me as a researcher, to look at how identities are promoted. So um, the European... Uh, at European institutions or national governments might also, uh, in the most active way, uh, promote identities as a kind of PR uh, uh, strategy, not just to administer the existing diversity, the, uh, the existing uh, cultural diversity, but proactively to promote uh, notions, uh, notions of Europe, to, uh, to campaign for it very actively and uh, to sell uh, Europe, to sell the core values uh, of Europe. Uh, one example, for instance, are the symbols that are used by uh, the European Union, the flag or the anthem we just talked about, or to emphasize the historical achievements uh, um, of European integration, which are meant to enhance a general feeling of Europeanness, uh, to create some attachment uh, to the EU uh, by the citizens. So the emphasis then is on the role of culture and education in the promotion of the new European identity. And this is analyzed by researchers like, for instance, uh, Chris Shaw or Roberta Sassatelli. They have done important work uh, on precisely these aspects. Please. I'm sorry, I'm just not quite sure if I understand the difference between administering and selling identities mm -hmm. because to me it seems like you they're almost equal in the way mm -hmm. you explained it. So what is the difference between the two? Yes, you are right. This is the emphasis here is on the administration of the existing diversity. And cultural policies are used here in a protective way. Whereas here, this is a more proactive way to promote unity. Uh, not only to administer the existing or the underlying diversity, but to promote something new, to promote a feeling of Europeanness among young people, for instance, that they should become more European. So, uh, uh, but you are right that in both uh, cases, we look at the role of political actors, 
uh, of uh, European institutions in particular and policies that are launched or developed uh, by European institutions or by the European Parliament or whoever uh, is involved in these activities. We can also look at the role of intellectuals, non-institutional actors. Yes. Um, I'm sorry, but how does the act of differentiation then play a part in the last point? Because in the other two, we can sort of trace it, but in the last one, maybe not so much. A bit differentiation? Act of differentiation, that's how you defined collective identity? Yes. Well, I just said that you have here the emphasis on diversity, and here you have the emphasis to promote a particular unity. So you have, again, the element of a, a, a unity in diversity, the underlying formula that that is expressed in two different kind of policies. Policies of uh, cultural protection, protection of minorities, protection of regional identities, subsidiarity, and here uh, the promotion of something genuine uh, European. So you find again this underlying formula, unity in diversity, informing uh, these, uh, these two strategies, which of course run parallel. Yeah? I hope you did not lose too much of the lecture. <laughs> okay, now you understand me better again. It's the same. Yeah, so these kind of qualitative approaches I am discussing with you in one way or the other relate to the social constructivism paradigm. And um, what do we mean by this? Well, the classical text here that is always quoted is a text you are probably familiar with, Benedict Anderson, Imagined Communities. Uh, he says that uh, collective identities uh, need to be uh, reconstructed uh, historically, uh, and he does this precisely, as I propose it here, through the role of communication and public discourse. Benedict Anderson identifies newspapers and what he calls as print capitalism as a crucial condition for the diffusion of uh, national identities. So nation building through uh, print uh, capitalism, to, uh, through involving uh, newspapers, which made it possible to address uh, the whole uh, of society uh, by uh, particular, uh, or to include, to involve the whole of society in identity politics and identity talk. So um, I also quote in my own paper, I think, uh, uh, John Dreizek, he's an uh, Australian uh, political theorist, he says, collective identity is creation of discourse, not culture. So we have to do with discourses, and these are discourses which signify a collective in distinction to others. And this, by the way, is also the core of democracy. We locate in democracy the rule of the people and we signify the collective of the people that should rule us. You could even say that this signifying practice is the core of the political. The political is defined as a practice of collective decision making. So decisions that apply to a collective. So without the reference to the collective, we cannot define uh, the act of uh, the political. What is the collective? A, a political discourse distinguishes itself through its inherent logic of focusing and categorizing the self of communication. 
and the operations of politics, of the, uh, a political system, through collectively binding decision-making, they, uh, they produce a kind of imagination of society. And society here is conceived as a collectivity, as a collective to which these particular decisions apply. So collective identities, then, are not substantiated. I, am, I emphasized this before. There are no particular cultural contents that make uh, us Germans and, uh, and them uh, French. It is only through the discursive expression I am uh, giving to these particular contents that uh, I create uh, the, uh, the meaning in, involved in it. So political discourse, and in particular our, um, our ways uh, to self-identify as uh, members of democratic societies, this is linked intrinsically to collective identity talk uh, and representation of the self or representation of the collective, of the people, of the demos. So, the people exist as something that can be called a discursive representation, and notions of collective identity need to be discursively, uh, they, need to, they need to be represented for discourse, otherwise they would have no effect, no meaning. They would have no existence beyond discourse. As Treitzek says, there is no culture beyond discourse. So only discursive practice can constitute collective identities. And you also find this in a text by Gerard Delanti and Chris Rumford. I don't know whether this was part of the readings. Uh, it's a nice... Uh, um, Delanti also wrote a very nice book on European ide identity, The Invention of Europe, I think. Yes, Inventing Europe, exactly, yes. And um, he says that collective identity is not substantiated in any cultural contents that are independent from its discursive expression. So collective identities exist to the extent that people talk about it. And then we know if identities are necessarily expressed through discourse, we know where to study collective identities. In the most general sense, we do this in the public sphere. The public sphere is the locus of identity construction. And I am a public sphere scholar more than I am a scholar of collective identities. Therefore, I can only emphasize this. Uh, we. Uh, deal with the public sphere in one form or the other whenever we discuss collective identities. So for any qualitative research on collective identities, we need to turn to the public sphere. The public sphere is the place where these debates about the self and the other unfold, where the normativity of the collective uh, is negotiated, where reflection about the self and the other uh, takes place. And the public sphere then is also a key term to understand current processes of integration, of European integration, to understand how Europe is contested, the different meanings of Europe, the conflicts that make uh, Europe. All this is carried out through discourse and through uh, debates. The other question is, this is maybe also a bit challenging, from what I say now, one could make the conclusion that collective identities, in one way or the other, are related to the political. Which is maybe also challenging for some of you who look at collective identities in relation to culture, in relation to... Uh, uh, 
group formation. But I would indeed claim that collective identities in modern societies, in one way or the other, find political expressions. It is very difficult to detach, um, to detach identities from the political. I don't know whether you find this challenging or whether you would contest this idea. The reason I give for this is that collective identities are related to the collective, that modern society uh, is relying on a kind of imagination of political communities, uh, a collectives of self-decision. Or uh, um, modern societies are imagined as societies that can self-organize. This is the main distinction from traditional societies, traditional societies who were relying on a notion of uh, truth that, that could not be challenged. But modern societies are self-organized societies. The idea is that society uh, can establish political um, social order, first of all, uh, through, uh, th through endemic processes. And uh, this notion, in my opinion, cannot be detached from the political. So the kind of societies that underlie collective identities are political societies in one way or the other. But maybe this goes also too far now. I should... rather go ahead because I still have a couple of points I wanted to discuss with you which we maybe then do after the break. So we should have a coffee break now if this is okay and then later go a bit more into detail of uh, possible research avenues to, um, to approach European identity. And do you have any question at this point? You had a break, so maybe you discovered only over the break in discussing with your fellow, uh, uh, with your fellow students that something was unclear that you want me to clarify. No? Then I think I will use the remaining 45 minutes to become a bit more concrete. <laughs> <laughs> and to point you out, uh, or to narrow down the following research areas that we can approach through qualitative methods. One is that we analyze how people talk about the self and the other. How do they reflect about being European? What kind of discourses are mobilized by them? What discourses crystallize to talk about Europe, for instance, in the media? What discursive repertoire is available to talk about Europe? Is this a shared discursive repertoire if we do country comparisons? And this is, of course, different from public opinion polls because we look at debates as they unfold, uh, for instance, uh, in the media. We can use old media. We can use new uh, media for this. And why are the mass media relevant here? It is in the mass media that different identity projects are promoted, but also that they are contested. Identity conflicts are carried 
through the mass media. And if this is supposed to have any impact, it needs to be filtered through the mass media. So without mass media, processes of identity formation at the level of whole populations would have been impossible. This is also the basic insight of the historians, that the print capitalism, as uh, Anderson put it, uh, was crucial for the amplification uh, of national identities, uh, for intellectuals, for the promoters uh, of national identity to have any impact, they had to reach the populations through the mass media, to mobilize the masses. <laughs> yes, you will rescue this, I guess. Yeah. But then the question is, which media shall we study? Yes. Yeah, we can make examples. We need, uh, first of all, to establish which media, which media are relevant. So I said that we would look at media which we suppose have an impact. Media that reach also large audiences. So, if you think of your country, which media would you analyze? The media that talks to the whole of the nation. In Germany, these were the eight o'clock news, but this was probably only the case in the 70s. Today, there are no media to, that talk to the whole of the nation, which sees how fragile uh, this is. There is a process of differentiation, of privatization uh, of media that leads to a differentiation of audiences. Um, so the media uh, can no longer uh, be um, uh, made responsible. Um, there is no media that, uh, that carries uh, national identity talk or identity discourse. But what we find is uh, competition. And we find um, uh, contestation through the media. So we would usually select a kind of representative sample uh, of different media outlets, left and right, regional and national, or we can do this uh, comparatively uh, at the European level uh, to choose, for instance, quality newspapers from different uh, countries, from different member states, and then we would need to select particular debates in which we expect that expressions of Europe, identity talk about Europe, become salient. For instance, constitutional debates. This is something we have done in research. We have looked at how the, uh, we have looked at how Europe as a political project is debated, how democracy is contested, how a European democratic deficit is contested in the media. And you find that in the media all kind of, uh, of actors, political parties, EU institutions, governments, to contest uh, notions of the self or self-representation in relation to, for instance, the European democratic deficit. So the question then would be, for instance, who is the underlying collective if democracy is debated, is contested? Do we only identify as Germans against French, or do we uh, find, uh, or do we underlie some notion of uh, uh, shared goods as Europeans? Yeah.
Um, so, for instance, in your research, did you look at uh, mm -hmm. all the articles uh, during a certain amount of time, or you mm -hmm. just uh, made a sample? Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know how large was the project over time, mm -hmm. but uh, there are different strategies to that. And also, did you use some only discourse analysis, or you, you also used some other maybe numerical uh, approaches to that? Just, mm -hmm. just, just. And uh, the other thing was about the thing, um, if we choose quality uh, newspapers, I mean, obviously you, you mm -hmm. know about the, for instance, in UK, the Daily Mail effect, uh, how, we, the, how do we deal with that, also the, the, the influence of the not so quality <laughs> newspapers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, many questions. <laughs> First of all, uh, maybe I should refer to this last point, which is a legitimacy. So what we did in the research you just mentioned, we looked at how legitimacy is contested. And legitimacy contestations are intrinsically linked to debates about European identity. Um, how, uh, what kind of, uh, I refer here to uh, Luke Poltanski, who wrote a very interesting book uh, on, uh, 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 which, um, in which he underlies um, a, a different, uh, uh, what he called, uh, um, uh, 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 what he calls orders of justification that are kind of historically generated semantics through which we approach common goods. And these are contested. And these contestations um, can be analyzed through media debates, media discourse. This is um, 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 any public uh, debate uh, is relying on such orders of justifications by assuming that actors who speak out in public need to provide particular justifications, need to relate to established notions of legitimacy and make use of them, practice them. So you have a kind, uh, you can, uh, through uh, this kind of, uh, uh, through these references, um, uh, to, uh, by reference to Boltanski, you arrive at uh, particular categories that you can underlie, which you can use for your own uh, survey. And the other question you posed was uh, uh, the selection. The selection of newspapers. Yeah. Where do you analyze this? And again, this is contested. So, uh, there is no clear-cut answer. You would usually uh, make a representative uh, sample of different media outlets. And I was wondering whether you would, whether you would uh, uh, in your own research, you mm -hmm. would include these or you would exclude those, the tabloids or the most... Mm -hmm. just well, in my own research, I have excluded them, but I don't have a good argument for doing it. So... <laughs> So, so what, why did you do it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's no good argument. Um, you can find arguments to focus on quality newspapers, to say that quality uh, newspapers are the agenda setters uh, of political discourse that generates legitimacy. that uh, quality newspapers are also the main, uh, the main agenda setter for television. There are media surveys proving that also uh, television news, frequent, uh, that the television news and quality newspapers uh, interact and that uh, journalists cooperate uh, at, at this level of quality newsmaking or professional newsmaking, you can call it. This means that tabloids are kind of derivative from quality journalism. Um, but, but on the other hand, tabloids might have large impact on public opinion and will formation, larger than quality newspapers. This depends on the individual, con uh, this depends on a particular context. Um, uh, in the UK, this is definitely the case. In Germany, this might be also the case. 
Um, but it depends also on the particular debates. Some debates are simply ignored by tabloids. We know that uh, tabloids uh, tend uh, systematically to ignore Europe and European issues. But when they campaign for or, for, for, or, for or against Europe, they have large impact. For instance, right now uh, in the Euro crisis, you can assume that tabloids have a huge impact. So tabloids, it really depends on the case uh, you select and also on the country uh, that you select uh, for your uh, study. In Germany, in the UK, in Austria, tabloids can have a huge impact, but often, uh, particularly with regard to Europe, they completely ignore our European issues. In other countries, like uh, Southern Europe uh, or France, uh, tabloids play a minor role or simply do not exist. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about this. Uh, you, you, you talk about elite discourse here and official discourse. Yes. Um, and Sophie this morning has mm -hmm. spent a lot of time talking about um, when you ask ordinary people what they are, or if you listen to ordinary people speaking about Europe, they, they in fact don't talk about Europe. But I wonder if there is, I don't think this is your work, but if you're aware of studies that look at what we might consider sort of mass discourse on Europe, and it, this mm -hmm. wouldn't be obviously through mm -hmm. uh, media, but Twitter or Facebook or mm -hmm. any of these sorts of uh, new social media. Mm -hmm. um, have there been, to your knowledge, studies like this and, and you know, maybe around certain issues in the mm -hmm. weeks leading up to a mm -hmm. referendum or something like this? Yes. First of all, why do we focus mainly on elites? Is this a bias of us or are there reasons that we focus on, on intellectuals and elites as promoters of identity talk and identity discourse? Well, intellectuals historically have been the constructors of national identity. There's a very nice book by uh, Bernd Giesen. He's a German sociologist, which is called uh, The Intellectuals and the Nations, where he uh, reconstructs uh, precisely this symbiosis between intellectual discourse and uh, discourse uh, on the nation, on uh, uh, nationalism. And then intellectuals and elites are the agenda setters we find in the newspapers. So uh, there is a kind of official identity talk and identity discourse that is carried by uh, political uh, elites uh, and by intellectuals, which we suppose has an impact on the understanding of the citizens uh, and the ways uh, citizens relate to um, identities, the agenda setters, uh, so to speak, those who uh, shape the kind of uh, symbolic uh, forms which we use when we talk about uh, collective identities. So identities, in this sense, collective identities are uh, or can be reconstructed as elite projects. In, in, this is certainly true for national identities, and it is probably even more true for European identities. The ordinary citizens have not much incentive to reflect about they are being European uh, uh, whenever they are confronted uh, with notions of European identities. This is uh, mainly through the media, uh, through television, uh, uh, through reading, um, uh, or uh, whatsoever. So the elites shape the discourse in the political arena, and they are the carriers uh, of collective identity uh, projects as a kind of official discourse, which is relevant. Which does not mean that we cannot also look at processes from below. Uh, collective identification from uh, below. We would uh, usually do this uh, you were pointing out to the uh, social media. Mm. Uh, uh, from below, this refers, of course, to the kind of life world and to studies that deal with everyday interactions. You had yesterday, uh, I have seen in the program, um, 
lecture by Laura Kram. She does precisely this, uh, what she calls banal Europeanism, how Europe is made sense of in everyday life through very banal references, through the common currency, or banal ways of uh, talking about Europe. But uh, social media might become uh, very relevant, or the new media, the internet. And this is maybe very relevant also for PhD studies. Uh, some of you was mentioning that uh, doing qualitative surveys is very costly, very time consuming. You cannot really manage this. But social media opens a completely, uh, uh, social media open an entirely new field to see how, for instance, in Facebook, uh, people interact, build communities, and at the same time incorporate all the time constantly the official discourse. Because what you do uh, through social media is sharing. Sharing, for instance, inputs by intellectuals, by journalists, uh, by, by political commentators, by political parties, at the same time uh, uh, commenting. And this might be very relevant as a field for doing empirical research that can be also quite easily covered and controlled uh, by single researchers. So this is very open for, uh, for PhD projects. Any further question? So the starting point then for, for any qualitative survey on a European identity formation would be how to imagine the community of the Europeans. The community of the Europeans, which, which I have argued in one way or the other, is a political uh, community. There is this intrinsic link between what we discuss as European identity uh, to a political community. It's the same intrinsic link which we also underlie when we talk of a national identity. Also, a national identity is intrinsically linked to the political. If Europe is only a, a common market, we do not need a, uh, to talk about identities. Market, which is the exchange of goods, does not need to develop collective identities. But if Europe is conceived as a polity, as a political entity, then uh, uh, we are confronted with problems uh, of collective identification or processes of collective identification start from this moment onwards. So a market does not need an, uh, an identity, but the EU as a polity does. So uh, the identification is related to processes of political integration. And then we are dealing uh, empirically with ways to draw borders between Europe and something else. We need to distinguish Europe as a political entity from something else. We end up with the notion of, of what I call here the geography of European borders. This is something for historians to approach these kind of questions. Are you, uh, are there any historians here also, or are you mainly political scientists or sociologists? No historian. Yeah. Um, the other subject is democracy and legitimacy research. 
that when you discuss or when you approach Europe as a, a potential mode to democratize the European Union, when you confront the European Union with democracy, when you identify or criticize the European democratic deficit, for instance, uh, then you are dealing uh, intrinsically with questions uh, of uh, identity, of how to identify the demos that is underlying a European democracy. And yesterday you have talked about the banal Europeanism. Um, and I will distinguish this from another form that is quite frequently used uh, in talking about European identity, which I call the triumphant, the triumph of Europe. And if the banal Europeanism, you have probably talked about this yesterday, um, ends up in an affirmation of everyday life. This is, by the way, an expression of uh, the Canadian uh, uh, social philosopher Charles Taylor. Then uh, collective identities in a triumphant way are about the affirmation of the extraordinary. Your, uh, identities as linked to something that is extraordinary. And of course you can discuss then to what extent this everyday life identification is actually a sufficient expression of what we discuss as political identities in the triumphant way, which is the way uh, of the French Revolution, for instance. And then we can, in the last step, look at expressions of collective identities as they are contested right now in the moment of crisis, when suddenly everything becomes identity politics and is heavily contested. Whether a political entity as has been slowly been emerging in Europe over the last decades is strong enough to support uh, this. And I don't know how much time, we don't have that much time left. So I must be a bit selective. But as you have talked yesterday about the banal Europeanism, maybe we should talk a little bit about the triumphant Europeanism, as I call it, which are these attempts to constructs European identity to promote a European identity um, uh, as something superior to point out, for instance, the, the achievements of European integration to um, the success story of Europe, which we are kind of tired of uh, of hearing this all the time, because this is what our European leaders try to convince us all the time about uh, the um, high uh, values about the unique forms uh, of Europe. And the most obvious way to do this was maybe in the attempt uh, of constitution making, when Europe stepped forward uh, with the ex with the explicit project to write a constitution uh, for Europe, to settle the finalité of European Union and constitutionalize as a European democracy. That one, uh, and this was then uh, perceived as complying with the higher standards, the high normative values uh, um, that were um, perceived as uh, higher than uh, those of national democracy. So to promote a narrative of, uh, of the triumph of Europe over nationalism, you can call this. And this has not convinced, it has uh, failed the attempts uh, of intellectuals, of political leaders to uh, promote such a triumph uh, story 
of Europe over nationalism, the overcoming of national uh, uh, particularism, um, has uh, failed with uh, uh, it has failed precisely at the moment of referenda when the people were asked to support this. And we can discuss maybe a little bit the reasons why the notion of a triumphant Europeanism that follows a similar model of triumphant nationalism, a nationalism, of course, was always perceived as the story of, uh, of a triumph. Why has this failed? Or has it failed? Maybe it's only my impression that it has failed. The whole constitution making project. The idea of Roshka Fischer at that time, and also many intellectuals. He was, in, uh, he was supported by many intellectuals here in Germany, most prominently Jürgen Habermas or people like Ulrich Beck, who thought that Europe. Uh, or the whole idea of European integration would be something that uh, would uh, finally overcome nationalism, that European democracy could be constituted in a cosmopolitan uh, way, so the claim of Europe was used to overcome the divide of national identities. Why has it failed? You are not particularly inspired by it, maybe, yes? I was just thinking that um, it was very much an elite-driven process based on symbols but it wasn't sustained by discursive structures. There, there was no European discursive uh, mm -hmm. field, no European media. Um, mm -hmm. So it was ahead of its time, but I don't even know if it's the right way of putting it, actually. It was also perhaps simply too far from the people. Mm -hmm. I mean, all in all, in 2004, there were um, parliamentary elections. If we can take them, I mean, European parli parliament elections, and if we can take them as uh, mm -hmm. symptomatic of uh, uh, participation in the European project. Mm -hmm. uh, in many countries, the turnout wasn't good, and I think in all of them, the debates were national. <coughs> so, and also, prob uh, this is obviously just my opinion, but, uh, the, focus is, the focus was always very much economic. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, without shared European media, with, uh, without a shared um, memory, mm -hmm. uh, and also perhaps without uh, charismatic leaders mm -hmm. in Europe, uh, it's difficult to construct a sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The question is, these intellectuals, you said, were too far away from the people, the, uh, the elites too far away from the people. But on the other hand, at the beginning of the 19th century, these elites and intellectuals managed uh, to mobilize uh, uh, national identities, to convince the people of the relevance to be French or German or whatsoever. And uh, at the end of the... 20, beginning of the 21st century, the intellectuals fail to mobilize the masses. I, I don't know even how much, uh, mm -hmm. apart from Habermas in this case, uh, how much mm -hmm. intellectual support mm -hmm. <laughs> there was also, how much, how committed it was also. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah, so this might be another reason that there is less intellectual commitment uh, to the project of European unification than there was uh, to the project of national unification. Yeah. Uh, I can't believe 
This is really not normally something that should come to me because I, I'm supposed to be researching media, but I think we're heavily overestimating uh, the role of media in, in the mm -hmm. failure of the European constitution. But I wanted to say uh, on the intellectuals, there is a wonderful uh, book called, I believe, European Stories or something mm -hmm. like that, which deals precisely with European intellectuals. And what it shows is that the debates about... Uh, between intellectuals about Europe are still led in, in national terms and in terms mm -hmm. of national interest. So, so in this sense, uh, I think Marco is right when, when he says that there is simply no uh, intellectual support in the sense we probably envisioned it on the national level when, when nations were created, even though I can't say mm -hmm. that I am uh, particularly familiar with that process. But I, I wouldn't overestimate the role of the media so far, mm -hmm. so, so far as, as we have. And somebody mentioned very well over there that uh, the difference between newspapers that various people mm -hmm. read and the stories that these uh, mm -hmm. papers bring through shouldn't be underestimated when we, when we talk about creation of a, of a public discourse. Public discourse for whom? Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems a bit unrealistic to expect that all of this support would come. There was a wonderful example yesterday in the, in the evening debate at one point when uh, I believe Sophie mentioned when you were doing the research at one point somebody said uh, the only reference to the European uh, constitutional process was that the flyer was so thick that nobody would, would read it. And I think it's pretty much similar with, with the media as well. People don't want to read constantly on, on, an, on a concept that is fairly abstract to them. Mm -hmm. And if you don't present it in a way that it really does give something to them, as we were listening to yesterday about support for, uh, in, in the sense of realization of what your interest is in the whole European process, then no amount of media and no amount of writing can, mm -hmm. can really develop an identity. Mm -hmm. Sorry for... <laughs> yeah, no, but you raised a very interesting point, or a very important point, which is this symbiosis between political elites, intellectuals, and media, which was given at the beginning of the 19th century, uh, that they could use the media to amplify uh, their claims for national I identity, and precisely this is not given. To the contrary, we have to do it with... Uh, 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 with nationally rooted uh, media organizations, uh, nationally fragmented uh, television, and a kind of journalistic practices that is rooted in the nation state. So we can call this media nationalism, that the, uh, that the journalist is trained to be, uh, to be a nationalist, but not a Europeanist. And this is the way uh, the journalist works. The whole routine, um, the journalistic routine, the working routine, is based uh, on this, that the whole um, uh, uh, the socialization and the focus takes place uh, in the nation-state framework. And the whole agenda of uh, the media reflects this, of course. Please. Um, to be honest, I have to say I've got really big problems with this whole idea of overcoming the nation-state mm -hmm. by the EU integration process mm -hmm. in, in general, because um, the nation-state state in that sense is continuously portrayed as something bad, you know, you have to, it's not about overcoming the nation state, but about coming in, overcoming nationalism, I don't think that's the same. Mm -hmm. um, and what, what, what um, Fischer and Habermas and um, Ulrich Beck um, argued at the time of um, ratifying the constitutional treaty, um, I just think that's, that, that's too easy, you know, kind of trying to replace all the threats posed by nation state by saying, mm -hmm. okay, now we got the idea of Europe, and that's really the alternative. And, um, yeah, because, I mean, the, the EU consists of member states. The nation state is here to stay, at least that's my opinion. Mm -hmm. And um, they had, it had to be ratified by the member states. Um, mm -hmm. That alone, you know, I mean, it, it's, it, they were trying to, like, um, ignore the fact that we got these states and that, I don't know, I don't see it um, possible to, like, really overcome the notion of states and, like, you know, a European u union that is composed of different units. And I think, like, the, the whole debate about the um, Constitution Treaty was really framed in, in the sense of, like, now we've got Europe and um, mm -hmm. that's it. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's... So you would say that this is simply the wrong message, yes. that the intellectuals are wrong in the first place, uh, to even attempt it. And I, uh, the problem here is what is actually the kind of triumph that should be expressed through a European identity. And uh, 
they promote something which does not convince simply. This is what you would say. Or it cannot convince because there is no triumphal uh, message. What they tell us is kind of rather referring to the banal way of identification, the success story of, uh, of European unification, that we have peace for the last 50 years. This is not something that can mobilize uh, the, uh, the masses to speak out loudly uh, for Europe, to, to identify exclusively as European and no longer as, uh, as citizens of their uh, uh, nation state. So there is no overarching um, story um, that could really uh, mobilize the masses, as uh, this was the case, for instance, uh, with the French Revolution. Well, um, I think we should not even like look for that. I don't see a reason why we should try to um, mm -hmm. mobilize people in, in that field. I mean, mm -hmm. I know for, for what purpose. I mean, on the mm -hmm. other alternatives, why do we really like, focus on this? Mm -hmm. You know, Europe as a way out of all mm -hmm. the problems that we have mm -hmm. um, with um, you know the notion of, of a national collective. Yeah. I just think that's really like a sign mm -hmm. of um, being desperate, you know, to, to find new ways, but I don't think it's working. Yeah. And um, I, I'm not saying, you know, there's no possibility that mm -hmm. can happen. I just mm -hmm. don't see a reason why we should look for yeah. it in the first place. Uh, you are right here, because one could argue that this way of identification is the old, let's say, 19th century way that nation states identified. That has been overcome uh, by, let's say, the history of the 20th century, the failure of nationalism uh, in many parts uh, of Europe. So this triumphant way, uh, uh, one should not um, forget that this has uh, been replaced by the kind of trauma of the past, which uh, many uh, European nation states had to confront after the Second World War. So they had to confront uh, themselves with the sometimes complete failure of the old national project, as it was the case in the post-fascist countries. But then later also in other European countries, uh, the nation had to confront the old um, past and the failures of the uh, uh, past, which precisely have to do with this triumphant uh, way uh, of expressing national identities over others. And to replicate this uh, then in the European uh, context is not uh, particularly promising. What about, for instance, if you look at the way Christianity is used? as an identifier for Europe. But maybe you wanted to say something different, sorry. Was it you or you? I wanted to say something. Yeah. Because you, you were drawing on, uh, on the comparison with the 19th uh, century, and yes. I think that one of the differences is that uh, nationalism back then I mean, romantic nationalism, so not the, mm -hmm. the evil type of nationalism that mm -hmm. we had at the end of the century. Also, had a very strong cultural uh, background, which is still the basis of uh, national identity today. Many, mm -hmm. I mean, if I think about Italy, Poland, Germany, the, there was a very strong... Uh, there were many prominent intellectuals that were and remain prominent, and uh, I mean... These people captured the zeitgeist at the time. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would say that Habermas is a good read, but um, I mean, my personal impression is that he has been saying pretty much the same thing since the 90s, and things changed a bit. And uh, he simply does not cannot capture the zeitgeist. I mean, if if a young uh, European in uh, in Italy, in Catalonia, in Spain in Greece and probably also in other parts of Europe read Habermas, he doesn't really uh, talk to their problems, to their consciences, because we don't, mm -hmm. I mean, perhaps this is also not the right approach, but we don't remember war in Europe, and the, mm -hmm. the current problems are in employment, uh, it, this is completely ignored, so mm -hmm. it's a bit out of the real problems today. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. 
maybe it is also ignored because these intellectuals, Habermas and others, do not really have a story here. What they promote is a kind of cosmopolitan project, you can call it, which is to overcome the particularity of nationalism through transnational solidarity, rights, and an agenda of global justice. And Europe, then, is used for promoting this agenda of global justice. Europe is used to define a common good beyond the particularities of the member states that can be promoted in world politics. This is more or less the kind of project they have, and I call it cosmopolitan project, Beck, uh, Habermas, and uh, others, which is almost a way to overcome identities. They want to have an identity-free world, maybe. Yeah? But when we look at Article 49 of the Treaty on European Union, yeah. um, then we have a problem with this notion of cosmopolitanism because it says every European state, whatever that means, yeah. can apply to become a member of the European Union. So they're mm -hmm. replacing notions of, of, of nationhood, mm -hmm. nationness, if you want, uh, mm -hmm. with European, you know, notions of what it means to be European, which is mm -hmm. m probably a more complex notion, or I don't know. But it's the same thing, basically. Mm -hmm. you, do, you, you try to define, you know, membership through another idea of, of, of identity mm -hmm. and, and who you are as a state or as an individual or whatever. Uh, and that's what the whole project of enlargement is based on, you know, and that everybody mm -hmm. can join because um, then we could have, like, could include the whole world in one yeah. political project. Yeah, um, this is again, I think, a very relevant observation because it is indeed, it reflects the problem of drawing the borders of Europe here. If you apply precisely this discourse, which is also part of the official discourse applied uh, by the EU, there are no ways to show the borders of Europe. It doesn't make sense to throw a geographical uh, a border. Principally, it's like the old French revolutionary ideal, that everyone who assumes uh, the ideals of the French Revolution can join, can join the project of French Revolution, which is nothing else than the bourgeois of enlightenment at that time. Um, so it was... Uh, so as the French Revolution stood for the project of enlightenment that should be carried uh, through the whole world, uh, for these intellectuals, a, a Europe as a cosmopolitan project uh, stands for an agenda of uh, global justice, which Europe in this uh, particular uh, case uh, promotes, but, but, which, but which does not stop with Europe. And indeed, then... Um, Collective identifications are suspicious in itself and um, are constantly deconstructed, um, which is an interesting intellectual agenda, but cannot be turned into political projects. Or it cannot be turned into political projects that demarcate uh, uh, particular communities which identify through democratic self-government, uh, so to speak. So uh, if you cannot show borders, it also becomes at the end difficult uh, actually to locate democracy, which is the rule uh, of uh, the people, and then the people need to be identified in one way uh, or the other, and this is not always possible through these contingent uh, signifiers that are used here. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, this is, can be used as a kind of uh, almost a conclusion that um, European identity um, is kind of drawn between uh, the particularity that is needed to express identities and at the same time um, this motion beyond the particularism, uh, which are the European uh, nation states. Uh, but then at the end, uh, what is it uh, if it cannot be um, um, kind of, if that the European identity at the end needs to be given expression as a political project? 
And to be given expression as a political project, it needs to relate uh, to some notion of particular uh, community of uh, belonging. Okay, I think we can stop at this point. I didn't talk about crisis now. What I call here the disruptions of everyday uh, life, and which have to do with the fact that as a result of crisis, identities are again contested. But this is then in a form of what political scientists analyze as identity politics, or some even call it a new identity paradigm, which means that identities are mobilized against Europe. So again, in a particularistic uh, sense, and the political scientists speak here of a new constraining dissensus of the people of Europe who speak out against the project of European integration. And this is a process of politicization uh, of which, again, identities are the driving uh, force. So we have to do here with new processes of collective identities mobilized against uh, uh, Europe that gained prominence over the last uh, years and certainly merit our research attention. And, yeah, I hope we have some possibility tomorrow, I think. Is it tomorrow or on Thursday where we have a panel? Where we it's tomorrow, yeah, where we will discuss some of your work. Okay, then.